some sort of intro and whether I'm kind of piggybacking off of last week or I'm trying to say something profound leading into this week or whatever the Lord puts on my heart, I always try to start with something that will easily transition us into the message that correlates with the message and where we're going to be picking up if we happen to leave off in the middle of a chapter like we did last week. If you remember, I stopped at verse 26 of John chapter 12 last week and even this morning, you know, every all of my notes for the sermon were done except for the intro. And uh, this morning I, I turn on my computer and, and, I, and I sit there and and I'm like, I, I got to say something, you know, or I can just maybe open the Bible. And we could just start going. But I really wanted to start with something. And and um, the Lord just put it on my heart to remind us of what verses 25 and verse 26 of John chapter 12 tell us. It's, it's where I left off last week. And there's a reason why I believe the Lord put on my heart to remind ourselves of these last two verses. Let me read uh, uh, them for you just as a reminder from last week. Again, John chapter 12, verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. You know, I, I spoke last week about the necessity of being close to Jesus Christ if we are going to serve him. Of being close to Jesus Christ if we are going to follow him. We have to be in close proximity to Jesus Christ spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives physically as well. But it is a necessity. It is a requirement, quite frankly. And Jesus tells us this that if any man serve me, he says, let him follow me. You cannot serve the Lord Jesus Christ and not follow him. And the problem with many today, churches and Christians alike, is that they want to, they want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They just don't want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They want the comfort of Jesus Christ without the commandments of Jesus Christ. They want the crucifixion of Jesus Christ without the conforming to Jesus Christ. And you can't have that. It's impossible to have that. The Lord will not allow that to happen. The reality is, and we know this, and, and John the Baptist wrote this, he must increase. I must decrease. We have to decrease. We have to step back. We have to humble ourselves. As Jesus says, if any man would follow me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. It is utter denial of self. Utter denial. In every facet, in everything of our lives, we must deny ourselves pick up our crosses and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Many people have a hard time understanding this idea that we are to deny ourselves. But the scriptures, especially the gospels, Jesus promises us over and over and over again that in denying ourselves, we will be exalted. In seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of our needs, all of these things, he says, will be added unto us. And so there is great reward that comes with denying ourselves and following and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have got to follow him if we have any desire to serve him. And the, and the, and, and the other reason why... I believe the Lord put this on my heart this morning is this. If we are if we are going to truly understand what it is Christ is about to go through as we continue through the remaining chapters of John. If we are to truly understand it. If we are to understand what it is we're going to read and what it is we're going to see then we must ensure that we are following him. We have to. We will not be able to understand what it is that he wants to give us if we're not following him. And so I, I, I pray that we are in a position where we left off last Sunday in that I know that if I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, I need to follow him and that requires my proximity to him to be literally right next to him that is the only way that we are going to honor the lord first of all and obey him but that's how we hear from him that's how he communicates with us when we are in close proximity to him and that's how we are able to discern and understand what it is that his word is saying and so I, I leave you with that this morning as we get going because I want to make sure that we are following the Lord Jesus Christ so that he can speak to us and un help us understand what it is he is going through and experiencing as written in the Gospels as we continue to go through it. And so with that being said, if you haven't already done so, open up your Bibles to John chapter 12. I've got a very short thing I want to read for you. It's literally one verse because we're going to go ahead and, and, and park on this one verse for quite a while this morning. John chapter 12, verse 27 says this. Jesus writes, and these letters are in red. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Church family, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we begin to, uh, uh, well, as we continue to unpack John chapter 12, Lord God, I would just ask and pray, Father, for your presence to fall upon this room right now. Lord God, for the Holy Spirit, Lord, to occupy this pulpit, to occupy my tongue as I speak, Lord, my mind as I think, my heart as I feel. Lord God, I pray, Father God, that you would move me aside, have your way with me through these notes, through this message, Lord God, that you have assisted me in preparing. And Father God, be glorified in it today, Lord. I pray for these saints that are in front of me. Lord God, the saints that are watching right now and those that are going to watch later, Father, that they too would have their hearts and minds prepared by the Holy Spirit to receive what it is that we need to take away from this word this morning, Lord God. Father God, be settled in us and may we find peace in you right now as we begin to unpack John chapter 12. I ask and pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Point number one obviously coincides with verse number 27 in that his soul or his troubled soul, excuse me, is point number one, his troubled soul. You know, for the first time in the Gospels, we see that Jesus is feeling the weight and burden of what he knows is about to take place. He says, again, 
my soul is troubled. And his soul was not troubled like we would maybe think it would have been when he looked over Jerusalem and, and wept over the city of Jerusalem that we looked at last week when he was coming down from Bethany uh, uh, on what we would refer to as Palm Sunday. It wasn't a, a, a troubling that would maybe be stirred up from compassion over the crowds. Uh, it wasn't a troubling of maybe the poor or the needy or the war, uh, orphan or the widow. It, this wasn't a troubling that was caused by some sort of emotion that had to do with, with something or somebody else. His soul was troubled. I, I, we could call it vexed because of what was about to happen to him. And for him to share that, for John to record that Jesus said, and now my soul is troubled, for him to open himself up like that, this almost vulnerability we can call it, is absolutely profound to me. I, I, I love, and I've, I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, I absolutely love the humanistic side of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love that he experienced emotions the way we experienced emotions. I love that he had sorrow the same way we would have sorrow. I, I love that he can identify with me when I'm struggling with something. But here we see an, a completely different, almost brand new side of Jesus where his soul is troubled because of what he's about to go to. It didn't make him any less God. And it didn't certainly make him any less man. But man, he began to feel the weight and the brevity of what he knew he was about to go through. We see all throughout the Gospels the love and the compassion and the mercy of Christ. We see that he wept, we see that he grieved, and we see that he was troubled. And I love that God is not some statue that has no idea about what we feel and what we're going through. Who doesn't understand what it is we can possibly be experiencing, but who himself became like us in that he put on flesh, was subject to all things like us, and can, having gone through it all himself, be our comforter. In times of trouble, Christ can comfort because he himself was troubled. In times of grieving, he can comfort us. Because Christ himself grieved. In times of weeping, he can comfort us because he himself wept. It's not some silly statue. It's not some, it's, it's not some vain person on a wall. It's Jesus Christ. But then Jesus poses a question in verse 27. He says, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He didn't have an excuse for his soul being troubled. He could have easily said, and listen, we know when you get to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, save me from this hour. But in this moment, he's not making up excuses. Father, save me from this hour. Folks, isn't the first cry, isn't the first cry out to God in the midst of trouble to be saved from this hour, to spare us from the agony, to deliver us from the hurt? That's usually our first cry out to God. Save me, spare me, remove this from me. Can we find fault in Christ for saying the same thing that we would? Of course not. There is no fault in him. There is no shame, church family, hear me, in wanting to be taken out of something that is troubling us, that hurts us, that causes us grief. There's no, no shame in that. We don't want to go through it. I, I get that. But here's where Jesus sets the bar 
for you and I in how we should respond to trouble like Jesus is going through. And it's how he responded to the question. He says at the end of verse 27 and the beginning of verse 28, if you're following along, but for this cause came I unto this hour. He says, Father, glorify thy name. That's the response. That's the response. Jesus knew that he was in the center of the Father's will. He knew his purpose. He knew his calling. He knew his cause. And when we know that we are in the center of God's will, you and I, when we know our purpose, when we know our calling, when we know our cause through Jesus Christ, even when our soul is troubled, we can say, Father, glorify thy name. Lord, no matter what I'm going through, be glorified. Be glorified in my agony. Be glorified in my sorrow. Be glorified in my weeping. Be glorified in my mourning. Be glorified in my grief. Lord, no matter what, glorify thy name. Christ in asking, what shall I ask my father to be removed from this hour? No, rather, God, be glorified in me. Father, glorify your name in me in this hour. Verses 28 through 30 go on to say, Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. The voice of God came for the sake of the crowd that was there with Jesus. Three times, church family, is it recorded in the Gospels that the voice of God was heard on earth? Three times. The first was when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist at the Jordan River. It says in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven, there's the first one, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The voice of God being heard from heaven down to earth. The second one was on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus speaking with Moses and Elijah. Matthew 17, 1 through 5 says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a mount apart. And, his, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was light as uh, was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias or Elijah talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles: one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, while Peter spoke, behold. A bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So there's the second time in the Gospels that we hear the voice of God on earth from heaven. And of course, the third one being in our text in verse 28, which again says, Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Of course, this voice, the voice of God that was heard from heaven, was not for Jesus. Jesus knew the voice of God. He knew what his father's voice sounded like but was for the sakes of those that heard it. Listen, for Elijah's sake in the wilderness, Elijah needed to hear the still small voice of the Lord. Remember, 
we talked about this on, on, on uh, Wednesday. Elijah was discouraged. He was depressed. Elijah needed to hear the still, small, quiet voice of the Lord because of the season of life that Elijah was in. However, God's voice was likened to thunder here in our text, which, by the way, Job likens the Lord's voice to thunder. John the Revelator in Revelation likens God's voice to that of thunder and raging waters. But God's voice was likened to thunder in our text. Here's why. The crowd around Jesus on this day did not need to hear a still small voice. They didn't need to hear a still small voice. They needed to hear the power of the voice of God. They needed to hear the authority of the voice of God. They needed to hear the lightning and the thundering of God's voice to know his power and to know his authority, which would leave no doubt as to who his son was. So that they wouldn't forget so that it would be remembered that there is nothing like it. There is nothing like the voice of God, nor will there ever be. The name of the Father was glorified through the life of Jesus Christ. And listen, God said, and he will glorify it again. Well, what do you mean? If, if his name is already glorified, as the text tells us, how can it be glorified again? Now, the again was in reference to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Christ's death and in his resurrection, the name of the Father was glorified again. So you see, you have the name of the Father glorified in the life of Christ... And we have the name of the Father glorified in the death of Christ. No matter what, the Father is glorified. And that right there, church family, that is the blueprint for our response to trouble. Father, in my life, glorify thy name. And in my death, glorify thy name. Thy name, no matter what, Father, glorify thy name. That's the response that Christ gave to the trouble that was in his soul, to the vexing of his spirit that he was beginning to feel because of the trouble that he was about to go through. He says, in my life you've been glorified, and in my death I want you glorified. And the Father responds, I have been glorified. And I will be glorified again. Point number two. Who is this son of man? Who is this son of man? If you still have your Bibles open, read along with me. Verses 31 through 34. Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Christ knew that the hour of judgment was arriving. The climax of ages, if you will, was at hand, and the beginning of the judgment of the world was about to start with his death, burial, and resurrection. But look who it started with, church family. Look who it started with. It started with the prince of this world in verse 31. It started with Satan. The judgment of this world started with Satan. 
The beginning of the end of his earthly kingdom began when the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. Judgment started, will start, and starts with the prince of this world. Satan knows that he will soon be cast out. Satan knows he will soon lose his authority that God has given him over this world and be thrown into the lake of fire and his reign will come to an end. He knows this. This is not news to Satan. He doesn't know when, but he knows. You want to know why this world is so corrupt? Why lawlessness, immorality, why wickedness abounds? Because Satan's gloves came off the morning of the resurrection. And he is literally seeking whom he may devour. Stealing, killing, destroying everything he possibly can and dragging it down with him into the pits of hell. Satan has got to be behind the statement that misery loves company. Satan is not a happy angel. Satan has no joy. He does not rejoice in anything. He is miserable, sad, depressed, angry, frustrated, upset at what he did? No. Satan is not a repentful angel. He's angry at God because he can't be God. Misery loves company. He knows he's been defeated. He knows he can't win. He knows there's no coming back. And like a lion who at the end of his life battles to stay alive, a lion will fight to the death. I've seen lions, I've seen videos of lions literally fighting with broken backs, not willing to quit until their life finally is over. That's your adversary this morning, ladies and gentlemen. He will not quit. He will not let off. He will not release the gas pedal just a little. He is relentless in his pursuit of not only the world and the things in it, but church family of you more than anything else. Why? Because you are a child of God. And anything that is of God, he hates with a hatred that no one can possibly understand or fathom. He is clawing, he is biting, he is tearing at anything and everything he can sink himself into. And the prince of the world has to be judged before the people of the world can be judged. You must understand this. Before the people can be judged, the prince has to be judged. Then Jesus says, And if I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You know, there is something, <laughs> there's something profound about the cross. In, in, in my lack of intellectualism, I'm surprised I even know what that word means. I cannot, I cannot find the words to describe the cross and what it means to me. There's something profound about it. And to the multitudes of believers that have gone before me and are with me here today and will call upon the name of the Lord in the future... I believe that the cross means something to them that they often are not able to describe with any more words other than hope and love, salvation. 
to say that it's our everything church family, I still think it's an understatement to what the cross actually deserves. But what I can tell you is that the cross has so much power that all men are drawn to it. That's what Jesus says in our text. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now again, I don't need to go through a discourse as to what the word all means. But I can tell you again that all men are drawn to the cross. And look, they're drawn to it. All men are drawn to it. To either despise and reject it. Or they are drawn to it to fall at the feet of it. But regardless, the cross draws all men to it. The cross is a magnet to the hearts and to the souls of man. But here's the deal. The heart must be prepared to receive what the cross offers. Or it's not going to work. If, if, if you are living self-righteously and selfishly, You've created in your heart your own magnet. You're attracted to yourself. You want to draw people to you. You don't want to lead them to the cross. You want to draw people to you. And I'm no scientist, but I remember back in the day when you try to put two magnets together, they don't want to come together. Matter of fact, they fight to avoid each other. You're either going to be attracted to the cross you're going to be pulled to the cross because your heart has been prepared to receive what it has to offer or because of your own selfishness and self-righteousness, you're going to be pushed away from the cross because your heart is filled with yourself. Now this comment that Jesus said about being lifted up from the earth, it confused the crowd. Why? If Jesus was the Messiah, and according to the Old Testament, the covenant made by God with David was an everlasting covenant, and the Messiah would come from the house of David, then how could the Son of Man be lifted up and die? That statement confused the crowds. How can the Son of Man die? How can the Messiah perish? Who is this Son of Man? Let me share with you quickly 2 Samuel chapter 7 so that you understand why the confused crowd asked Jesus what they did. It says, And when thy days be fulfilled, beginning of verse 12 of 2 Samuel 7, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers... He says, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Church family, this was not told to David because of his son Solomon. Yes, David wanted to build a temple for God, but this prophecy was not about Solomon. This prophecy was about the Lord Jesus Christ, about the Messiah, and how through David's seed, out of his bowels, a kingdom will be established, and that Messiah will build a house for the Lord and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Church family, this, this is no new news. Solomon died. Solomon's kingdom reign came to an end when he passed away. The kingdom in which is being spoken about is the everlasting kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they ask at the end of verse 34, who is this son of man? Because it can't be the Messiah. It can't be the one who's from the bowels of David, from the seed of David, it can't be. 
Here's the deal, though. It's as if they perceived that Jesus was the Messiah because they're asking him, wait, you can't die. But they couldn't conceive that the Messiah had to be lifted up. Here's the deal. The Jews knew what they wanted to know from the Old Testament. But all you have to do is open up Isaiah chapter 53, which, by the way, is in the Old Testament, written to the Jews to understand that the Messiah needed to die for the sins of the world. As Jesus often did, he didn't answer their question directly. Who is the Son of Man? But he uses a metaphor that he has used before. He knew that his presence as the light of the world would soon end. And so he urged them to take advantage of that light while he was with them. You know, when you go camping in the wilderness and you're out and you're away from city lights, street lights, the whole nine yards, one of the very first things that goes through your mind is I have to take advantage of the light while it's still here. I need to set up camp. I need to get things in order. I need to make sure that when the darkness comes, everything that I need is properly taken care of. Jesus says, while you have the light, you best be taking advantage of the light because soon the darkness is going to come. You know, in my preparation this uh, past Friday, I was drawn back to John chapter 1 about verses 35 and 36 of chapter 12 when he speaks about the light. And I just want to remind you of what was said about Jesus in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4, in Him was life, and the life was what? The light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist, of course. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, Jesus Christ, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, speaking John of John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light, Jesus Christ. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The light of the world is Jesus Christ. But he knew that he would soon be taken up. He would soon depart earth and darkness would begin to set in. That is why, church family, he tells you and he tells me to go be the light of the world. To embody the power of the light and to show it and shine it forth unto the world. And here we are now in John chapter 12, and his own have received him not. John wrote in verse 1, he came unto his own, and his own have received him not. And here we are in verse 12, and they haven't received him. At this point, Jesus is 33 years old. He's coming to the end of a three-year earthly ministry. His fame has been spread abroad. 
And yet he is still not received as the light of the world. And the stern warning in verse 36 is this. While you have the light, believe in the light. Why? So that ye may be the children of light. Folks, while we have the light. My heart aches for those who when the church is taken away, when the light of the world is removed from this world, will experience a darkness they have never known in their entire lives. My heart aches for that. I can't tell you how, how much I worry about people. My own loved ones, my own kin, my own family, my friends. Are they really saved? The day is coming when the light will no longer be available. When the light will be turned off in this world. And darkness will rule and will reign. And I warn all with the same urgency that Christ spoke in. While you have the light, believe in the light. I want to close with this this morning. Read with me verses 37 through 41. We're still not done with John chapter 12, by the way. We'll get at it next week. But read with me verses 37 through 41. It says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, Yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, speaking of Isaiah, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. Church family, if you're following along in your Bibles, underline that statement in verse 39. Therefore they could not believe. Because that Esaias, or as Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. Church family, they could not believe. It was impossible for them to believe. Why? Because religion got in the way. Religion got in the way. And you've heard it said before from this pulpit, religion postpones the kingdom. They could not believe. How heartbreaking is it? That because of one's arrogance, because of one's pride, because of one's selfishness and self-righteousness, they cannot believe. And don't a, for a second blame God for hardening hearts. Pharaoh refused to believe. Though he saw the miracles of God, Pharaoh refused to believe. And so God allowed the hardening of hearts. If you're going to continuously refuse God, that heart will continuously become a heart of stone. It happened to Israel. And Ezekiel prophesied about it. Lord, turn their hearts of stone to a heart of flesh. And it was happening at that exact moment with Jesus Christ, where religion got in the way and their hearts of stone could not believe even though they saw the multitude of miracles that Jesus Christ had performed. 
And for the Jews who knew the word of God, uh, they, folks, they pride themselves on knowing the word of God. They can spew off, especially in the Torah, they can spew off literally almost the entire five books, first five books of the Bible. Ask any Jew, what does Leviticus 28.9 says? Say they might need to process it for a moment, but they'll tell you. They know the word of God, but here's the deal. They cannot understand nor interpret the word of God properly. They interpret it for their own selfish desires. They interpret it for their own selfish gain. And any other interpretation of the scriptures outside of what is written in the word of God is a false interpretation. And I can't tell you how many religions that align themselves with Christianity have written their own versions of the Bible. The Book of Mormon has been written. The Jehovah's Witnesses have their own Bible. You have a million different interpretations of the scriptures in your ESVs, in your NIVs, in your NASBs, in your NLTs, and all these other things. I'm telling you, anything that is contrary to the scriptures is false doctrine and was made because of the arrogance of man. Their hardened hearts and their blinded eyes could not understand the report, nor could they understand the arm of the Lord. Isaiah prophesied it. They could not understand it. They could not see the arm of the Lord in and through their Messiah, Jesus Christ, literally standing right in front of them. And this text gives credence to the reality that faith is required to inherit the kingdom of God. Faith is required. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, there is no conversion and there is no healing without faith. Church family, I pray that you have believed the report through the scriptures. I pray that you have believed in the revealed arm of God through Jesus Christ. While the windows of heaven are still open, it's not too late to be converted and it's not too late to be healed. But that light, church family, will soon be taken away. And lest you believe, darkness will be all that you know. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Church family, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for the revelation of the scriptures. Lord, thank you, Father God, for giving us this book, for giving us the word of God, for even allowing us, Lord God, to have insight into who you are, into what you are. Lord God, into what you would have us be. I thank you, Father God, for giving us this blueprint, if you will, for giving us this instruction manual. I love the acronym of the Bible, Lord God. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Lord God, I pray, Father God, that as we depart this morning, that, Lord God, your word would resonate with us. Father God, that we would understand truly why it was that your soul was troubled, knowing what it was you were about to go through. Father God, that we would leave here this morning knowing who the Son of Man is. Lord, the religious folks asked who the Son of Man is, and I pray for everybody listening, watching, and that's going to watch later, that they would be able to answer the question, who is this Son of Man, with the only answer that's applicable, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, continue to do a work in and through this ministry, in and through this church family, Lord God. I pray for them and I lift them up to you, Lord God. Meet and exceed all of their needs, Father, and expectations. 
guide them and strengthen them, heal them, encourage them, Lord God. Minister to them, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father God, be with us as we go forth today. I ask and pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.